I would sit on the limestone wall at the entrance to my high school from morning into the afternoon. I would wait there hoping to see, well, to see a car turn in the drive. I would wait there until my coach would send the manager to get me and insist I come to the locker room uh, and get dressed for the game. I was waiting on my father to arrive. He would promise, he would promise on that day he would come and see me play. It was a promise he wouldn't keep. My father never saw me play a single down of football in high school or in college. Didn't see me play any sports, not even once. He didn't see Kay. He never met her. He never met my children, his grandchildren. He was not, he was not there uh, to help me bury his, his sons. But as I got older... I realized it wasn't that he wouldn't keep the promise. It was that he couldn't keep the promise. The scars of the Korean War were just too deep. And they kept him from me. Kept him from me and from the rest of us. He couldn't keep his promise. Now, what I'm about to say may sound a bit like blasphemy to you, but if there is no resurrection, then God cannot keep his promise to save us. If there's no resurrection, God cannot keep his promise to save us. I know that we've all grown up with uh, saying, well, Christ has died for my sins, and therefore I'm okay. I get a get-out-of-hell-free card. But that's an incomplete statement. If Christ has not been raised, we are in a world of hurt. Now, I'm not the only one, and certainly not the first one, to say that. St. Paul At the end of his meandering first letter to the Corinthians, he wrote two rather long meandering letters to the Corinthians. But at the end of the first one, he makes this stark statement. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is in vain. And our sins are still shackled to us. If it's only for this life that we have put our hope, then we are the most to be pitied. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is in vain. That is some pretty tough words at the end of that letter. It's in the 15th chapter. Seeing especially that at the beginning of that long letter, in the chapter 2, Jesus, I mean, uh, St. Paul says, I have resolved to know nothing amongst you but Christ and Him crucified. Well, seems that he knows a little more than that. The truth is this. The fissures of our sin, the deep, the deep cuts of our sin are just too deep. They're just too deep. They're like valleys. And if Christ has not been raised... Uh, We can't be pulled out of that. You know, most of us know that um, what it's like to feel separated from God, although I don't think we really ever are completely, but you may may, uh, recall even in the last couple of weeks a time that you were um, ensnared in sin. I don't mean salacious sin. I mean that you were overcome with anger over over someone you were living with, or you began to be kind of haunted by resentment, or uh, you began began to 
to realize that you were eaten up with unforgiveness, something I've talked to you about a lot. And when we're in that state, we feel separated from God. We certainly are separated from the others. It is a terrible place to be. And we'll generally do anything to leave, to leave that deep, dark valley, that cut, that fissure, uh, and be reconciled. Well, I'm telling you, if Christ has not been raised, separation is the human condition. And separation is our destiny if Christ has not been raised. The second thing I'll tell you, that if Christ is not, is not risen, then we cannot fulfill our role in Christ's kingdom. Both St. James and St. Paul contend that you and I have become a sort of first fruits of God's new creation. First fruits. Now, that has deep biblical underpinnings. I mean, starting in Genesis 4, we begin to hear about bringing the first fruits. Cain and Abel are the first to do that. You bring the first portion of your harvest. You bring the first and the best part of your flock. We're no longer in an agrarian age. So we bring the first portion of our income. We bring our best gifts, not our leftovers. Perhaps uh, you've thought about our singers up here and our instrumentalists. I have been, I've always been amazed at Jennifer and Bob's ability and Gail and Jennifer's ability. But since uh, we have been um, attacked by this, by this, uh, uh, this coronavirus, this one strain of the coronavirus, I have never heard them offer their gifts more powerfully. And that's just, a, that's just being honest. Um, they are giving not their leftovers, they're bringing their first fruits, uh, their very best. And that's what's expected of us in terms of our giving. But James and Paul says we are to become a sort of first fruits, a taste of the, of the kingdom that Christ brings, a, uh, an hors d'oeuvre of the kingdom to come. You and I are... are um, are, are, are living witnesses of the hope in God. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty important right now to, to be that. Uh, you know, I'm hearing lots of, uh, of, of, uh, un, of unhealthy um, chatter out there, looking for someone to blame for this malady that's beset us. But we, as the first fruits of of God's new creation know that, that this malady ha, has completely covered the whole world. It knows no boundaries. And perhaps as the first fruits, we will look beyond that and say, hey, this is a time. This is the time so that we may come together. I was teaching a Bible study this morning at, uh, on Zoom, the TriPoint YMCA, and one, of the, one, uh, one attorney said this. He said, this is the time. This is the moment. That's how first fruits talk. We look for hope, and we're in a world right now that needs that. But I say to you that if Christ is not risen, we aren't first fruits. We're just buffoons. And if Christ has not been raised, the new life, uh, that's advertised just isn't available. It's just play acting. And of course we know eventually you have to take the mask off. You know, Jesus loved to use the term hypocrite, which is just, just an old Greek term for, for actors who wear the mask. And eventually we know if it's not real, the mask comes off and the real and, and, and the genuine article comes out and it's going to be pretty ugly. You know, in Paul's subsequent letter to, the, to Colossa, uh, by the way, the Colossians are people he'd never met. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote those beautiful lines um, uh, that uh, Jim Berg's in, uh, intro um, uh, described powerfully. And he says, uh, he says, 
If you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Do not set your mind on earthly things, but set your mind on heavenly things. Because you have died, and your life is hidden with God in Christ. If you, if you have been raised, seek things that are above. The promise is this. Christ has been raised, then we get an engine overhaul. Our inmost self gets a complete transformation. And this is, this is what happens gradually, I grant you. What happens gradually is that, um, is, is, is that we begin to want the things that Christ wants. We begin to want the things that he wants. Every morning I say a prayer from the St. Augustine prayer book that, uh, that ends with, O oh Lord, help me to walk in your ways and live as you do. I want to be like you, but I can want that all I want to. But unless Christ is raised, it is absolutely impossible. I am stuck in the deadliness of my sin. Because you know, death, death, is the consequence of sin. Death is the consequence of sin. It is the separation. And we experience that here and now and later. Christ is not raised. Paul's magnificent, rousing lines to the Colossians are nothing more than a locker room speech. Go get them, boys. It has no punch. But I'm here to testify to you as your pastor. Christ is raised. He's risen. We know that 500 people encountered Christ after he was raised. There's never been a historical study that could disprove uh, his resurrection. And if I didn't need any more proof, how about our world last Sunday? People all across the world could not be constrained for celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. They were on patios and in living rooms. They were in street corners. Wherever they could be, they were celebrating the risen Lord because He has been raised. That you can count on. Sin has been defeated and death has been vanquished. We know that on this side of the veil and on the other. I stand here tonight at, this, at the exact hour when 32 years ago on this day, I was ordained. It was, uh, it was um, a wonderful evening for us. I was still coaching at that point. And I asked the Bishop of Alabama if all my basketball players could be acolytes. And as long as I live, I'll never forget what they looked like, those willowy athletes feeling rather uncomfortable marching down the aisle of All Saints Church in Albs, which felt, well, like, you know, like straight jackets to them or something. But they huddled around me as I took my vows and made my promises. It also was an uncertain time. Kay and I had agreed to accept the call to leave uh, the comfort of academia, a place where I knew uh, who I was to go to Tyler, Texas, a place, <laughs> a place where people even dress up to go to the grocery store. We went there, and it was a whole new environment, a whole new life for us. Every priest knows what that feels like. John was two, Catherine was six, Clay was ten. Um, and the adventure was on, and it still continues. I want to tell you that I have never in the ministry that God has given me felt more zeal for the Lordship of Jesus Christ than I do right now.
in the midst of this crisis. I feel refueled. I feel as if the Lord is going to do something with me and with you that is unexpected and wonderful. I met with the core leadership team today. And we all made a covenant with God that we're going to walk back to Galilee and we're going to reconnect, which gives us fervor. And I can tell you that it's going to get better. That I promise.